Alright, hi everyone. I hope you guys are having a great day. So, several announcements to make with this lecture video. So, first of all, today's video is going to finish up the information on physical development in infancy, and then we'll also cover the slides on cognitive development in infancy. And then that last set of slides on infancy will do for the material for exam two. So, we'll do social development in infancy next after exam one. So after today's lecture video, you will have all the information that you need for exam one. So to help you prepare for exam one, I will be posting a review video where I will go over the study guide which is posted for you on Canvas and you can email me if you have any questions as you prepare. So exam one is going to open at noon, 12 p.m. on January 27th and it will be open a week so it will close noon, 12 p.m. the next Monday which is uh, February 3rd I believe. So it'll be open a week. Now please notice that it does close at noon, 12 p.m. It opens and closes at noon. So if you would like to take it in the evenings, that's fine, but you cannot take it in the evenings on, in the evening of February 3rd because it will be closed. So if you want to take it late at night, you need to do that before then. Okay, it's going to close at noon on February 3rd. Opens on January 27th, closes on February 3rd. I'm reiterating this because sometimes I have students get confused because they forget that 12 p.m. refers to noon and not to midnight. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions about that. So, also to help you prepare, there will be a practice exam for extra credit that will be open in Canvas at the same time as the regular exam. You don't have to complete that. That's optional. It's only a little bit of extra credit, but it's also there to help you see what types of questions might be on the test and to potentially guide your studying as well. So my recommendation is to watch this lecture video and go ahead and do the activity for this week, which is going to be due by Friday at 5 p.m. We'll talk about the topic for the activity during the video. And then start studying, watch the review video, take the practice exam, and then when you feel like you're ready, take exam one. Just remember that it's going to close at noon, 12 p.m., on February 3rd. Okay, So let me know if you have any questions about any of these announcements, otherwise we're going to go ahead and get into lecture. Alright, so as I said, today we're going to be finishing up the slides on physical development in infancy, and then we're also going to be talking about cognitive development in infancy. So this first slide for today is talking about the nervous system. So this information is important to understand physical development. Um, this is a biological process, but of course you have to have a certain level of physical biological development in order to have cognitive development, to have a change in how you think and how quickly you think, that kind of thing. So the emerging nervous system, the nervous system is of course something that continues to develop and grow. Uh, your nervous system is uh, growing throughout adolescence into early adulthood. As a matter of fact, the frontal lobe of your brain is not fully developed until around age 25. So the nervous system is certainly something that's in uh, process throughout adolescence and into adulthood. But talking about the different component parts of the nervous system, the cells that make up the nervous system are called neurons. And I have a picture of neuron. I just googled neuron so I could have something for you guys to look at <clears throat> while I go through and talk about these parts. So a neuron has a few different uh, important components here. So when it talks about the soma here, so this is, a, this is a neuron, this is a nerve cell. The nerve cell is made up of a soma, which is the cell body, that is surrounded by dendrites. And then it has a long projection called an axon and the axon is going to end in axon terminals. This is sometimes called terminal junctions or terminal buttons, several different terms here. So neurons, nerve cells, make up your nervous system. They communicate with each other. They pass messages. And the way that this works is that information comes in the dendrites, and then it will go down the axon to the axon terminals, terminal buttons, terminal junctions, whatever uh, term you're using. Now, once it gets to the axon terminals, it wants to continue the message on into the dendrites of the next neuron. But neurons don't actually touch each other. There's a little bit of a gap in between the axon terminals of one neuron and the dendrites, the receptors on the next neuron. So in order for the message to pass, it's going to have to cross that gap, which is called the synapse. The way that that works is that tiny chemicals, neurotransmitters, are released from the axon terminals. They cross the synapse, that little gap, 
and then they bind to receptors on the dendrites of the next neuron and then the message is continued on like that. So the message comes in the dendrite, goes down the axon to the axon terminals and then the message causes neurotransmitters to be released, little chemicals to be released into the synapse and they cross that gap, the synapse, and then they bind to receptors on the dendrite of the next neuron. So one thing that's important for um, development as we age would be this axon is covered in what they call a myelin sheath. It's a fatty tissue, it's white, and the axon being coated in this myelin allows these messages to be transmitted more quickly. But you are not born with your axons fully myelinated. They're not totally covered in that myelin sheath. That's something that happens on throughout adolescence. So as you get older, as that myelin builds up on your axons, then messages can pass more quickly. So that's just one example of how your nervous system is developing as you age. So, as we said, we have the soma, the cell body, that is surrounded by dendrites. The message comes in the dendrite, down the axon, to the terminal buttons. You see that term here. It could be terminal junctions, axon terminals, whatever. The terminal buttons then release neurotransmitters <clears throat> that cross the synapse, that little gap in between, and then they bind to specialized receptors on the dendrite of the next neuron. So this is how messages are passed. Now, a few other terms here when we're thinking about the nervous system. So the cerebral cortex is the surface of your brain. It's the outside of your brain. You probably know that you have uh, four lobes in your brain that have different functions. So you have the occipital lobe, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe. And your brain is divided into left and right sides. So you have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. Now. If you take a brain and you're thinking about you know, cutting it down the middle from the top and we have the left side and the right side, they're not exact copies of each other. There are a few structures, for example, that are found on the left side that are not found on the right side. Uh, an example here would be that the uh, speech centers are found on the left side of the brain, not on the right side of the brain. So <clears throat> although the two halves of the brain are very similar, they're not identical copies of each other. And the two hemispheres, the two halves of the brain, are connected by something called the corpus callosum and this is a group of bands of fibers that connect the left side of your brain with the right side of your brain and allow the two hemispheres to communicate with each other. Alright, <clears throat> so this whole set of slides is about physical development in infancy so we have development in our brain that is a physical development that then also allows for motor skills to advance. So you have to have a certain level of biological, physical development to be able to sit and to walk, for example. So one thing to note is that the ages that are listed on these slides are kind of averages, but there will be individual differences. So there's a wide range that would be considered normal. It says infants usually sit alone around seven months. Some may do this earlier, some may do this later. As far as walking is concerned, it mentions 14 months here. This is about the time where a toddler, and I think really after your first birthday, you're kind of considered a toddler, not really an infant anymore. But after uh, around 14 months, toddlers can usually walk a little bit on their own. They may take some steps before then, some walk earlier, some walk later, but usually those first early steps are kind of hanging on to someone or something, very shaky, not, not uh, very uh, balanced, but then as they get older, of course they get better at this. The theory is, and talks about the dynamic systems theory here, is the idea that although walking, for example, seems like a very simple task to you perhaps, for a toddler who's learning how to walk, it's not that simple because there are several different skills that are in, involved in this process. And so what we have to do is we have to have these specific skills, these distinct skills that are developing separately, and then we're kind of combining them together. So you think about walking involves, there's a certain strength that you have to have in your leg muscles. There's a certain amount of balance that you have to have that even some of us adults are not fantastic uh, with our balance. Uh, and there's some coordination that's involved here. So what we're seeing is that we are learning these skills, and then once we start to learn these skills, we have to organize them and reorganize them and get better at them to meet specific tasks. Walking, um, for example, walking uh, in shoes versus walking barefoot. I can remember the first time 
we put my daughter in shoes. She just screamed. She did not understand what was going on. She could walk without the shoes, but she didn't want to walk with the shoes. It was a totally different uh, situation for her. So you have to be able to use the skills you learned in different environments, in different situations, and that takes practice and refining those skills over time. So the idea is that walking is made up of lots of different skills that you combine together. And if you have learned all these separate skills, then you put them together without even thinking about it. But you have to master each of those component skills first, and then you have to combine them together to be able to do this successfully. Uh, driving is another example of this. Driving a car to you might seem like a skill, like one skill, because maybe you've been driving for a long time and that's comfortable for you. But there are lots of different things that you're doing, right? So you're steering, you're controlling your speed with the pedals, you're looking, checking your mirrors and your blind spots. So you have to learn each of the separate skills and then combine them together to be able to do that skill successfully. It's the same way with a toddler that's learning how to walk. And that's why it does take time and effort and, and praise and reinforcement for them to learn how to walk. Now it says that independent walking usually occurs somewhere in the range of about 12 to 15 months. Every once in a while you will hear of kids that start walking a little bit earlier than this and it is possible that a child might start walking later without any serious issues um, but usually somewhere in this range that's when kids start walking on their own. <clears throat> now walking would be an example of a gross motor skill. Fine motor skills, on the other hand, are something that involves precision. So, for example, handwriting would be an example of fine motor skill. So, fine motor skills that uh, very young children are learning, well, it talks about grasping, holding, manipulating objects. This takes a lot of effort because there's coordination involved. You have to have a certain level of vision to be able to see a small object, pick it up, grasp it, manipulate it in a certain way. So, it says that around four months, Infants can reach for objects, although they may look like they're just kind of batting them around, like they're not really grasping them very well. And then as they get older, it talks about about five months, they can use both hands to maybe pick up the object, to grasp an object. This might be a time when babies start holding their own bottle, for example, if they are um, being bottle fed, they might be able to use both hands to hold a bottle, at least with some success there. And then other fine motor skills that kids are learning early on, it talks about using zippers. It's a lot easier than using buttons. Um, buttons may take a little while. Tying shoes is something that we wouldn't expect to see until around age six, but this is also something that's dependent on the environment. So a parent would have to make their child um, learn how to tie shoes. They have to teach their child how to tie shoes, uh, of course, in order for them to acquire this skill. But other fine motor skills that are going on around this time, kids are usually learning how to color, they're squiggling, these uh, early handwriting tasks, um, which is important uh, for later being able to write. What about their sensory organs? So we're talking about senses, we think about the five senses. Um, smell, taste, and touch are especially good, even uh, in newborns. So this is something that is helpful for them as far as survival is concerned. So when it talks about smells, um, babies uh, are able to differentiate between different people, for example, with different smells. They recognize what mom smells like, other familiar people smell like. They learn that pretty quickly. Uh, and so they do prefer to be around smells that are pleasant and familiar. So sometimes uh, a baby might calm down if you wrap them up in a shirt that mom was wearing or something like that because the smell is familiar to them. Taste is something that's also important for survival in newborns. So uh, they have very similar sense of taste as adults do. Uh, one thing that's a little bit different uh, is that they have a special preference for uh, sweets, uh, sweet taste. So it talks about them having a sweet tooth here. Now, some people are concerned about what should I feed my baby? Am I going to give my baby a sweet tooth if I give my baby fruit before I give my baby vegetables? Well, the good news is you're not doing that. The bad news is that's already been done. Babies are born with a preference for sweet tastes. And the thought here is that breast milk tastes sweet. So it is helpful for babies to be born with a preference for something that could be their main source of nourishment. I say could be because babies might be formula fed, but 
either breast milk or formula should be their primary source of nutrition for the first year, although usually solids are introduced um, somewhere around four to six months, but you're mostly just getting them used to different tastes and textures there. Most of the nutrition is still coming from breast milk or formula. So it talks about uh, changes in mother's breast milk. The thought is that uh, an advantage to breastfeeding is that babies are exposed to different tastes because the taste of mom's milk does change a little bit depending on what she's eaten, and that might help prepare babies for uh, variety in their diet later. Of course, babies have a sense of touch, and they may prefer to uh, be touched in certain ways, so um, being patted or bouncing, rocking, that kind of thing. Uh, one thing it notes here is, of course, babies have a, a sense of pain, and we can tell that because there are certain types of cries that they have uh, when they're in pain. I think we may have mentioned this in the last lecture video, but if you're at the pediatrician's office and kids are getting their uh, shots, then certainly you'll be hearing this pain cry, this uh, high-pitched wail where they kind of pause and gasp and start screaming again. So certainly babies do have a sense of pain. Now, as far as hearing is concerned, we know that infants can hear, although they don't hear as well as adults do. This is something that's uh, developing uh, as they get older. But we know that they can hear because there are startle reactions. So babies will uh, oftentimes throw their arms out, almost like they're trying to grab. And that could be a reflex for kind of reaching out for mom or someone to steady them. So startle reactions, loud noises, babies usually are not a fan of loud noises. Um, and there may be certain noises that babies do like. So sometimes um, parents might have like a white noise machine or, or something because perhaps baby got used to hearing noises in the womb, um, heartbeat, uh, mother's stomach gurgling, that kind of thing. So baby is used to hearing that kind of noise. So. Uh, when it talks about the startle reaction here, uh, an infant's hearing is going to be tested in the hospital um, to see uh, to make sure baby has a normal hearing before they're sent home. Uh, however, babies can't hear as well as adults do. Um, their best hearing seems to be sounds that are similar to human speech, uh, which makes sense. We're going to talk about language a little bit, and we're going to see that um, there is a theory that we are biologically prepared to acquire language. Um, certainly babies can respond uh, to certain songs if they hear them frequently that may soothe them. Uh, so sometimes parents have a particular song that they sing to baby uh, to help baby calm down. And yes, babies do recognize their own names. Uh, if they hear their name frequently, then you may be able to get baby's attention uh, when you say their name after around four months. As far as vision is concerned, vision is the sense that babies are lacking most when they're born. Uh, certainly there's not a lot of opportunity to practice vision in the womb, so it's going to take some time uh, for that to develop. It talks about newborns being able to respond to light and track objects, and they'll continue to do this with more accuracy as they get older. So um, one thing I had heard is that if you're holding a newborn in your arms, kind of cradling them, that distance from where their face is when they're cradled in your arms to your face is about their ideal vision. So being that close to you, that's about where they can see your face the best. Uh, it talks about infants being able to see at about 20 feet. Uh, they probably can't see well beyond that at first, although it says by about one year their visual acuity has improved substantially, almost as good as adults. Now when it talks about cones here, uh, so in your eye, in your retina, you have receptor cells uh, for vision, and you have rods and cones. And rods and cones have different purposes uh, for seeing different kinds of things. So rods are uh, cells, receptor cells in your eyes that help you see in the dark uh, and kind of black and white versus cones that help you see in bright light and help you see colors. Uh, and so perhaps newborns don't have as many cones uh, as adults do. They have uh, less of an ability to perceive colors, although as they age, that does develop. Babies do like looking at faces, and you might wonder, as I'm going through talking about this, how do we know if a baby recognizes something or what babies like? It's not like we can give baby a survey. Uh, well, what we usually do is we look, give baby different options of things to look at, 
Um, what does baby spend more time looking at is, is one way to gauge a newborn's interest or a baby's interest. So newborns like to look at moving faces. Uh, and so think about making faces at a baby, uh, playing peekaboo, that kind of thing. Um, babies do enjoy that, uh, although they do also track other things as well as they get older, not just faces. Um, things that move are exciting and interesting and entertaining to them. As they get older, it seems like they learn how to recognize faces, and they like to look at familiar faces. Now, yes, even before this, babies prefer to be held by people that they know, but it could be that they are recognizing them by their smell or by the sound of their voice, not necessarily just by being able to discriminate between their face versus another person's face, uh, although they do gain that ability. And it seems like then by about seven to eight months, infants begin to process faces similar to adults, kind of looking at a face as a whole rather than uh, made up of different component parts, seeing the arrangement of features, learning how to recognize uh, familiar looking faces. Now, something that we would be interested in would be the self-concept of a young child. Uh, your understanding of yourself as being a unique, separate individual, uh, being separate from your environment. And this usually happens somewhere around age two. That's what the research tends to say, that we start to be aware that we are kind of separate individual, uh, autonomous creatures. And one way they do this would be with um, what they call the mirror test. So what they'll do is while a baby child is sleeping, they'll put something on their forehead, usually like a little marker, put a little red dot on your forehead. And then when baby wakes up, they'll show the baby a mirror. And if the baby is aware that they're looking at their reflection, then they'll try to wipe the mark off of themselves. Like, wow, look at me, there's something on my face. And they'll try to wipe it off of themselves. But if they're not aware that it's them, they might try to wipe it off of the mirror. Like they think they're looking at another baby hey, look, that baby has something on its face, and they'll try to wipe it off the mirror. Uh, but some other things that research says here, toddlers like to look at photographs of themselves. Uh, so we are egocentric from the very beginning. Uh, they refer to themselves by name and use personal pronouns, so they're starting to understand that they are unique, separate individuals. Uh, and then as they start to understand who they are and develop a self-concept, an understanding of who they are and what makes them uniquely them, they will begin to describe themselves usually with very concrete things. So a child might say, okay, hi, my name is Maddie. I have red hair and blue eyes. My daughter's name is Maddie and she has red hair and blue eyes. Uh, you might say, I, I can you know, dance and I have a purple stuffed toy. So... They're talking specifically about very concrete things. When I ask you what makes you who you are, you'll probably start telling me about your personality traits or your future aspirations. Well, that's not something you're going to get from a preschooler. They're not capable of that yet. Okay, so we are also going to talk about cognitive development in infancy today. So I'm going to go ahead and pull these slides up. So we've talked about physical development. We have changes in our physical body, biological development, but we also have cognitive development. So we're talking about changes in the way that we think. So this set of slides will talk about thinking, memory, attention, all these cognitive processes that are beginning to develop in infancy and then carrying on throughout life. You have uh, a lot of development that happens later as well. So it talks about children being explorers of their world, and certainly kids do love to explore. And the way they explore depends a little bit on their personalities, and it depends on their age. Of course, um, very young children explore by putting things in their mouth, and they want to chew on uh, everything that they can get their hands on. So children are active scientists. They're exploring. They're trying to make sense of their world. There is so much for kids to learn, and of course, during that early time period, that information they're getting is coming primarily from caregivers, from people in their environment. So this could be babysitters, teachers, of course parents would play a very important role here. So the idea is that children start to develop schemas, or you might hear them called just schemes, uh, mental categories where we're making a category for things that go together. Now, two reasons this happens. First of all, 
This is the way our brain is set up. We like organization. We like to categorize things. But also, in addition to that, that's usually how we teach information to kids. So I'm going to use this example of animals a lot. But we talk about different features. And this is what makes something a mammal, and this is what makes something a reptile. So we categorize things because we like to categorize things, and then also because that's usually the way we are taught to understand things. So we're going to be continuously adapting to our environment by refining our schemes, our schemas, by changing our categories as we bring in new information, which then talks about a couple of similar um, characteristics here, similar um, processes, assimilation and accommodation. So both of these are about gaining new information uh, and they're about our schemes, our categories. So it says assimilation involves fitting new experiences into existing schemes. So let's say, for example, that you've been taught what a mammal is, and then you come in contact with a new animal that you've never seen before. So this is a brand new experience. I've never seen this animal before. However, I have a scheme for mammal. So mammal has hair or fur. Mammal is warm-blooded. Mammal feeds their babies milk. So when I see this new thing that I don't even know what this is, but I am going back to my scheme for mammal, and I'm going to say, okay, well, this animal has hair, and this animal feeds baby milk, and this animal is warm-blooded. It must be a mammal. We're assimilating our new experience into an existing scheme. However, there may also be times where we have to modify our schemes because we've taken new information. For example, you might have a scheme, a schema, for what a mammal is, but then you might come in contact with a platypus. And a platypus, while being like a mammal in a lot of other ways and, and is technically a mammal, a platypus lays eggs. So you might then have to adjust your scheme for mammals. You came into a situation, you experienced something new, that this is a mammal, but it doesn't fit into my current scheme for mammals. So I need to change my scheme a little bit because it's not entirely accurate. It is possible to be a mammal and lay eggs, even though it's pretty rare, it is possible. So you have to be constantly using your schemes, but then also updating your schemes or schemas to make sure that they are accurate. So when we talk about cognitive development, this kind of harkens back to Piaget, who uh, I believe we discussed in our theories lecture. So Piaget was a developmental psychologist who was studying the way that children develop over time. And so he broke development down into four basic periods. And then you could have sub-periods within each of these, but four general categories here. So sensory, mo uh, sensory motor period, excuse me, from zero to two years, pre-operational period from two to seven years, concrete operational seven to 11, formal operational 11 and up. And the idea is that there are different um, cognitive skills that are developing in each one of these stages. Now, a few things to note about this. We are going to talk about sensory motor here in a second and pre-operational because we're talking about young kids. As we go through the class, when we start talking about older kids, adolescents, then we'll go back and talk about the other stages as well. But remember, when we talked about different um, different theories, this would be a discontinuous view of development. So he has very discrete, specific stages. You're in sensory motor up until two, and then when you reach two, you jump up to that next stage. So you're going to stay at about the same, and then you're going to jump up to that next stage as you mature. Also notice that the assumption here is that everyone develops at the same specific time, which could be a criticism of Piaget. We'll talk about that. But during the sensory motor, so this is from birth to about age two, during this time kids are uh, learning a lot about their world. Of course, not able to do a lot of logical thinking yet. So when it talks about sensory motor, they're taking in information through their senses and through their motor skills, and they're trying to learn about their environment in that way. So they start to have deliberate means-ends behaviors. So I am trying to do this for a specific purpose. Excuse me. I am trying to get to this particular toy because I want to play with it. I'm trying to get to this particular piece of food because I want to put it in my mouth. So the idea is that this develops around eight months. Something else that happens during this time is object permanence. So very young children before age about 18 months 
have not yet mastered object permanence. So if they can't see an object, then they probably don't even have it on their radar. They may not even realize that it still exists. For example, if a child is playing with a toy and you take the toy away from them and cover it up with a blanket, if the baby has not yet learned object permanence, then the baby is not going to go looking for the object. Like, it was here and now it's gone. It's just gone. And the concept that it's still there but it's hidden from sight is not something they understand yet. But then, around 18 months, they start to understand that you took the toy and hid it under the blanket. The toy is still there, I just need to move the blanket to get to it. This is something they're learning during this time period. It also talks about them being able to anticipate consequences, of course, uh, not as well as you'll be able to do as you get older. Uh, but you begin to be able to understand that when I push something, it falls over, right? So then instead of needing to push everything over to know that it falls, they'll start to have some understanding of that and perhaps be able to adjust their behavior accordingly, although this is going to be continue to be refined uh, as they get older. And then we move into pre-operational thinking, which is from around age two to seven. So during this time, kids are trying to think logically. They're beginning to somewhat, <clears throat> I don't know how many conversations you've had with a three-year-old. You're not likely to be able to win any kind of argument with a three-year-old. And I know some three-year-olds that are worse than others. But um, the idea is that there are certain ways of thinking that are fairly common during pre-operational stage. So that's seven to 11. Uh, a few examples of uh, ways of thinking that are pretty common here. Egocentrism. So the definition of someone being egocentric means that they are seeing something from their point of view and not able to see things from other people's point of view. So, for example, uh, if you're sitting on one side of a table and a child is sitting on the other side of the table and you say, what can you see? They will tell you about what they can see from where they are sitting. That's from their point of view. And then when you ask the child, okay, well, what can I see? They will think that you can see the same things that they can. Even though you're facing a different direction, you're sitting in a different location, the idea that you're seeing something different from them won't occur to them. They won't be able to put themselves in your shoes to be able to imagine from where you're sitting what you're seeing. This is something that develops later, but most kids from 2 to 7 are not able to do that. It talks about animism here. So sometimes kids during this particular stage might think that inanimate objects, objects that are not alive, have lifelike properties. Uh, so for example, a child might say, well, the sky must be sad because it's crying when it's, when it's raining. So thinking of the sky, which is an inanimate object, as having emotions and having the ability to cry and being similar to a human. So this is also kind of similar to egocentrism, uh, assuming that something has similar properties as yourself because you're alive, so assuming that other things are alive as well. And then centration, which is something I'm going to show you some examples of this on the next slide, how it relates to conservation. It says centration is concentrating on only one facet of a problem. So usually multitasking is not something kids are able to do during this stage. They're only able to focus on one property or one characteristic at a time. And it talks about this interfering with conservation. Conservation in this particular uh, situation is the idea that you can change the properties of something a little bit uh, or you can change the way something is organized and not change the amount of the substance. Let me give you some examples here. So you might say to a child, is there the same amount of water in each glass? And the child will look at them and say, yes, that's, that's the same amount, okay? Glass A has the same amount of water as glass B. So now we're going to change our configuration a little bit. We're going to pour the water from one glass, let's say glass B. We're going to take it and pour it into a glass that has a different shape. And then ask the child, now is there the same amount of water? Well, obviously the answer is yes. The water in this cup being poured into this cup did not change the amount of water, but it looks different. The child will probably get hung up on the level, the height, and not think about the width of the glass. So this is conservation. 
You might ask the child, are the same number of pennies in each row? And they'll say yes, the top row has five and the bottom row has five, okay? And then you stretch out this top row and say, now are there still the same number of coins? And they might say, no, the top row has more. Because it doesn't look the same as it did a second ago, we spread it out. So centration is focusing only on one aspect. Here we're focusing on the width of the row. Here we're focusing on the height of the water. And we're missing some other very important pieces of information here to be able to correctly answer this question. Now, a child in the pre-operational stage is not likely to get these types of questions right. All right. So what can we do with Piaget's theory? How can we use this to help educate children? Well, it talks about creating environments where children can discover. So we said that children enjoy acting like scientists. They want to do experiments. So giving kids some hands-on things to play with, to practice with, maybe giving them water. Now, of course, you have to be careful in what environment you give kids water because they'll spill it everywhere. But maybe in certain situations, give them water in different size cups. Uh, give them a sand table with different kinds of containers. Let kids explore their environment. Also, perhaps we could provide them with experiences that are a little bit ahead of where they are so that they begin to understand the things that are coming up they have some level of understanding when they go up to that next level. They have some background information to help them as they begin to develop into more advanced uh, logical thought processes. It talks about helping children discover their inconsistencies. Kids are not going to be able to think logically, but maybe we can set up situations to show them what errors they're making so they can learn from them perhaps. So talking about the pennies, when we stretch the pennies out, and the child says, no, the top row has more pennies because it's wider. Then we can have the child count each row. We can push those pennies back together, spread them back out, spread out the ones on the bottom, and try to help the child see what kind of error they're making. However, Piaget's theory is a good general rule of thumb, but it's far from perfect. One thing that uh, has been pointed out is that infants and children, very young children, may be able to do more than Piaget thought. Perhaps it doesn't take as long to develop some of these skills as he thought. But then also, perhaps his view of adolescent cognitive development um, doesn't give adolescents enough credit. We're going to talk more about his views on adolescent, adolescent development excuse me, when we get into that time period in the class. But perhaps he overestimates their cognitive ability. Also, how do you go from sensory motor to pre-operational? Is that only a biological process? Or does the environment also play a role in that? The environment playing a role in that doesn't seem to show up much in Piaget's theory because he assumes that everyone goes from one stage to the next at the same time period, not taking into account the environment. You would think that a child that was getting more educational uh, opportunities might get into that next stage a little bit earlier versus a child that's not having those opportunities might take a little bit longer but Piaget's theory does not take that into account and of course there is going to be some variability so a child might have some pre-operational skills and still be in the sensory motor stage and have some skills that are still back in the sensory motor stage so development is not always discontinuous it's not always stage like as Piaget thought However, Piaget's theory is a good rule of thumb. Maybe not perfect, but it is helpful. All right, so let's talk about some other cognitive issues here. It talks about attention, uh, and later in the class, I'm sure we will talk about um, attention, specifically things like ADHD uh, that may be diagnosed in, in school-age kids. But attention happens when sensory information receives cognitive processing now you are constantly having input from your sensory organs assuming that all of your sensory organs are functioning you don't have difficulty with hearing or with vision uh, then you are constantly having information come in through all of your senses and there's more information coming in than you need or want so your brain is very clever about being able to filter out things that are not important and one way you do this, it talks about habituation, that you have a lessened reaction. Have you ever noticed that when you walk in somewhere new, you smell what that place smells like, but then after a few minutes, you don't smell that smell anymore? You don't recognize the smell. Or maybe there's a sound. Maybe uh, the clock ticking on the wall is something that you stop hearing 
because it's been ticking pretty consistently, pretty constantly. So this helps us to ignore something that's insignificant. If something is constant, then it's not going to be something that's alerting us to danger. Usually a change in smell, like there's smoke, or a change in sound, like there's a predator, there's a noise, something's creeping up on us. It's a change in our sensory information that says something's wrong, we need to give it attention. But something that's fairly consistent, we will kind of stop paying attention to over time. Now, the sensory information that you pay attention to receives that cognitive processing and then is in your awareness, can be in your short-term memory, but if you don't pay attention to it, the information doesn't go any further than that. Now, something that is important for our development would be learning. We talk about learning, we're talking about gaining new information or new behaviors. There are a couple of different important aspects of learning. There's classical conditioning and operant conditioning. And without going into any great detail, classical conditioning is just about learning associations. So it gives the example here about salivation and a bell. What they're talking about here is Pavlov. So this is the kind of stereotypical classical conditioning experiment. So the way that this worked was they noticed that when they presented dog food to a dog, the dog would salivate or drool. That's what we mean when we say salivate. Now the food naturally caused the dog to drool. That was already happening. They didn't cause that to happen. That was a natural process. But what they learned was that if they presented something at the same time as the food, like for example a bell, the bell was originally neutral. But if you ring the bell, give the food, ring the bell, give the food, over time the bell gained the ability to produce the response of salivating or drooling. The dog would drool when he heard the bell. Why? Because he had learned the association between the bell and the food. Well, this is true for humans as well. Uh, there are lots of applications of classical conditioning. Um, but when it talks about infants learning this with feeding, so milk is a natural stimulus that causes a natural response. The, the baby is maybe happy. The baby, um, maybe the baby salivates a little bit. I don't know. But the baby learns that certain things are associated with food, like a breast if you're being breastfed, or a bottle if you're being bottle fed. Uh, and so the baby learns what is associated with the food, which is then helpful for baby survival. So uh, it's very natural for us to learn things, learn associations. Now another way that we learn is through operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is all about consequences. So when you engage in a certain behavior and it goes well for you, you're more likely to do that again. You've received reinforcement. If you engage in a behavior and it does not go well for you, then you're less likely to do that again. You've received punishment. A couple of examples here. The behavior of giving flowers to someone results in you being kissed. Well, that's reinforcement, probably, assuming you wanted to be kissed. Not necessarily. Not a, Okay, but the idea here is you wanted to be kissed by this person. You gave them flowers. The person kissed you. So now you're more likely to give flowers in the future this consequence of your behavior made that behavior more likely to occur again. But if you give someone flowers and they slap you, then you are less likely to give flowers again in the future. This is punishment. Well, the same is true for kids as well. Uh, a child might be reinforced for talking, for example. The baby starts babbling and they get attention, they get praise, the, the mom or dad starts smiling at them. You're reinforcing their language behaviors. But then there may also be behaviors we try to decrease. Um, we tell the baby, no, don't do that because they start to scratch or to bite or pull on your hair or something. And that would be giving punishment. Uh, of course, without going into any uh, great tirade here, there are certain types of punishment that are more appropriate than others. And I am certainly not advocating for punishing infants. I, I think that's a terrible idea. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that if you want to decrease a behavior, you can just reinforce an incompatible behavior. So if you want to decrease the baby uh, pulling your hair, then you could reinforce the baby for gently touching your hair uh, instead of having to punish but that's a whole nother conversation. All right, we also learn through imitation. We learn through modeling other people. We know this is true. This doesn't stop at a certain age. You still model the people that you're around too. Now, the question is, when do we start imitating? 
We know that older infants imitate. We can see this pretty clearly. So um, they'll engage in behaviors that they've seen adults engage in. But what about very young children? So perhaps, for example, you smile at the baby and the baby smiles and you say, wow, the baby imitated me. The baby was modeling me. Or you make a sound and the baby makes a sound back at you. And the question is, okay, was that baby imitating me? The baby was making the same sound that I made. Perhaps it could be, uh, could be um, coincidence, but it could also be that the baby was making the noise. So you started making the baby, the noise back at the baby. Um, without paying attention to what you're doing, instead of the baby imitating you, you might be imitating the baby, which is okay too. We certainly, certainly do that. Talking about reinforcement, I have a very young, very little one, um, and my eldest really enjoys making him laugh. And so whatever my oldest son does that makes my youngest son laugh, he will do over and over and over again because he's been reinforced. Hearing the baby laugh is reinforcing for him. All right, memory is another important cognitive process. Now, we do not remember uh, the very first part of our life. And I say the very first part because I think there's a different range and different people have different thoughts on exactly when you start remembering things. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the parts of the brain, hippocampus, amygdala, uh, with emotions and with memory, uh, develop early. And if we can learn, then we can remember to a certain extent. So why is it that we don't have autobiographical memory or memories of events that happen to us when we're very young? Even if you can learn and, and your hippocampus is developed, why do you not remember when you were six months old? Well... Uh, perhaps it's not developed enough. Perhaps you don't practice that memory. You don't revisit that memory. Maybe it's because babies don't have language. And so it's hard to remember something you don't understand because you don't have uh, the language. Uh, and perhaps it's because we haven't developed a self-concept yet. So we don't understand what's happening to us. But we do see autobiographical memory, memory for events happening to us in preschoolers especially significant events, whether they be negative or positive. As you have this sense of self of who you are, being separate from your environment, then it does make it easier for you to understand. But in addition to your hippocampus that's involved with memory, uh, your frontal cortex is also very important. Um, we're talking here about being able to retrieve information from long-term memory. Your frontal cortex is where a lot of your thinking happens. And so being able to process information happens a lot in the frontal lobe. So if we're talking about memory in children, then there is the question, can we trust what children say when they tell us a memory that they have? And especially what about an eyewitness situation where there was a crime or something that happened to a child or a child witnessed something happening to someone else? One thing that we will see is that children can be potentially accurate witnesses, but you have to be very careful in how you handle this situation because they are very vulnerable to suggestion. So if you ask a question in a certain way, you're likely to get the answer you were leading the child towards. Uh, so if you say, this person did this to you, didn't they? The child will probably say yes, even if they didn't do that because it's kind of a leading question. So the best thing to do is to interview right after the event happened before the child forgets. Tell them that it's okay to tell the truth, that they're not going to get in trouble for telling the truth, and that it's okay to say, I don't know. Kids might feel like they're supposed to have an answer, and so you might ask a question, they don't have an answer, they make something up because they feel like they have to give an answer. So having an answered option be, I don't know, can be really helpful. Um, and asking the question in a way that is not leading that doesn't say, this is what happened, isn't it? Which essentially says, this is the only explanation I'm going to let you give me. Uh, letting the child tell you the story in his or her own words can be helpful. But of course, this is really hard. If we're talking about a child as an eyewitness testimony situation, then certainly there's uh, something has happened here that is disturbing. Uh, it's very easy for uh, emotions to be high here. Uh, but if we want to get the best answers, these are a few suggestions. Now, another theory that we briefly mentioned earlier would be about Vygotsky's theory, which is about the zone of proximal development, which you're going to see on the next slide. Vygotsky's theory is all about learning about your culture from people who know more than you do. 
So Vygotsky would say that there are lots of situations where there is a shared understanding of an activity. So, for example, freeze tag. Freeze tag has rules. There may be some variation on exactly what those rules are, but there are rules to a game. And so, if you've never played freeze tag before, you're going to learn how to play because someone else who knows more than you do about the subject is going to teach it to you, right? So you're going to engage in structured activity with other people who, at least in this one particular area, have more skill than you do. They're going to guide you through it until you know how to play the game as well. So Vygotsky might call this apprenticeship. So the master, this sounds a little Star Wars, like the master has the skills and is going to teach that skill to someone who doesn't have that skill yet. Now we think about something very simple like the rules of a game, but this is also important for more complex things. We learn from other people uh, what kinds of behaviors are appropriate in our culture. How are we supposed to respond to certain situations? What's the right way to handle death? What's the right way to handle uh, a baby being born? Exciting situations. We look to other people to give us clues about that, which is why those kinds of situations are handled differently in different cultures. And we learn from people in our culture that know more about it than we do. So this is going to promote our development for teaching something to someone who knows less than we do. So this brings up the concept of the zone of proximal development. This is the idea that if you spend time teaching information that's too easy, you're wasting your time. The child can do that alone. If you spend time teaching something that's too hard, they can't do it even with your help, you're wasting your time. The child won't be able to master that. But there is a sweet spot, this area where the child can do the task with your assistance. And that's your zone of proximal development. They're not able to do it on their own, but with just a little bit of help from you, they are capable of learning it. And so you have a zone of proximal development for each task. There may be some tasks that you are better at than others. We have a zone of proximal development for cooking and for uh, setting up the Wi-Fi in your house. I mean, for every skill, you have a zone of proximal development. And there'll be some things that you're at a more advanced level and some things that you're not. And that particular uh, situation, you will learn from someone who has more skill than you and they will help you do something. You'll have this zone of proximal development where you can do it with someone else's help, but you can't do it on your own. So trying to keep kids in that zone of proximal development will help them to continue to grow. So scaffolding basically is the help that you receive from a more skilled, uh, usually older, but an other person. So you should give just the right amount of assistance. So if you give too much help, they won't learn how to do it on their own. And then also they may become dependent on that help and kind of resent having that help removed. So you do have to give um, the right amount of help and then gradually pull that help back so that they are able to do it independently when they're ready. Uh, but you do need to provide enough help that they can do it. Uh, once again, thinking about that zone of proximal development. We don't want the task to be too easy or too hard. There's a sweet spot for each person for each skill. And of course, this is helpful thinking about education, but if you're a teacher and you have 25 first graders in your class, you're going to have a wide range of ability levels. Different students will be in different zones of proximal development, and it's difficult to keep them all in that optimal uh, zone. All right. Another cognitive process here it talks about private speech. I think we all do this to a certain extent where we have this internal monologue kind of running in our brain all day long, kind of talking to ourselves. Well, with kids, uh, this talking to yourself is usually audible. Kids will talk themselves through something out loud. They're trying to figure out how to spell this word or how to draw this picture. And they'll be talking to themselves, but it's not intended for you. They're just talking to themselves. This is helping them think. They're thinking out loud. And you may find yourself thinking out loud too, but usually as you get older, you internalize it. And so it's a thought process that's happening internally, so it's private at that point where no one else can hear it, it's just for you. And if someone else could hear your thoughts, they might not understand it. You may be thinking in kind of shorthand in your mind because you know what you mean, but if you were verbalizing that out loud, people might think it's a little bit strange. They don't quite understand what you're saying uh, because they're not in your head. They don't understand the way you think. I think it's probably a good thing that we're not able to hear what other people think. Just a personal thought there. All right. 
And then our last major topic for today has to do with speech, so developing uh, speech. Speech is going to start uh, from very early on in our process here in our development. Um, of course, an infant is not able to do anything but cry uh, in that very early time period, but their crying is a form of communication. They have different cries for different needs, and parents can learn to kind of match up the need that's associated with the cry. Uh, but a phoneme is a small unit of sound. It's a unique unit of sound, a phoneme. So if you're thinking about phonemes, think about phonics. So A says ah, that kind of thing. So one-month-olds can differentiate between vowels and consonants. They have a little bit of a different sound to them, and they start to understand uh, the different sounds uh, are coming from your mouth. So they'll start watching your mouth and, and seeing that that's where the sound is coming from. Now, one thing to note here is that different languages have different phonemes, have different sounds. There are certain phonemes that we just don't use in English, which then means that if you're not exposed to that language early on, it can be very difficult for you to acquire that language later. It's hard to make your tongue say that sound, right? You can't roll your R's or, or whatever the sound is that another language uses that we don't use because you're used to hearing the sounds in our language. So very young children are capable of acquiring any phoneme. So the baby can learn to speak any language that is spoken to baby. However, eventually, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so baby is going to focus, kind of specialize on the sounds that they hear most frequently, so the phonemes that they're exposed to. And they may lose the ability to differentiate between phonemes or to pronounce certain phonemes. And that makes it harder as you become older to try to learn a second language. So the best time to learn a second language is very early on. We'll get to that in a second. So children are going to learn to pay attention to words that are repeated. And so oftentimes we try to teach kids words early on. And maybe it's for ego reasons. Say mama, say daddy, say dada, right? Uh, or maybe we're trying to teach them words like more or bite or food, you know, words that they can use. It is amusing to listen to and watch how people talk to babies. And it's it's very natural. Uh, it's not something that we do intentionally. Sometimes we, the way that we find ourselves talking to babies, and they actually call it mother ease, although this doesn't happen just in mothers. Certainly I hear my husband making these, these sounds at our kids too. Um, but infant directed speech, an adult without even thinking about it will talk in the way that a child best hears without even realizing it. Babies understand you best when you talk slowly and with the different pitches and different volumes. And I would sound ridiculous going through and talking on this lecture video the way that I talk to my baby. But it's mother ease because moms do. They, they talk uh, to their babies in very uh, unique and interesting ways. And just one example of how ridiculous this can sound is that I will talk to my baby and then I'll turn to my six-year-old and I can't bring myself to talk to my six year If I talk to my six-year-old the way I talk to my baby, she would look at me like I was insane, right? All right, uh, so we talk to babies in the way that they enjoy hearing. Without even realizing it, we are helping baby to learn language. So at about two months, infants begin cooing, and then around six months, toddlers, it calls them toddlers here. You might still call them infants, different terms that are used here, but they begin babbling. So a cooing is more of a vowel sound, kind of a ooh, ah, eh. And then babbling has... Um, some consonant sounds in it as well. So ba 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 da da ha. You know they start having some other sounds in there as well. So babbling is going to be a very important step towards speech later, and they're going to start making sounds that are similar to the sounds that they hear. So not just repeating the phonemes that they hear, but they're going to say them in the same way that they hear people talk. So the tone that you use, the changes in pitch that's similar to what they usually hear, which may be one reason why my kids are so loud, because they grew up around each other and they were loud from the beginning. Good. All right, usually a first word happens around one year. Could be a little before, could be a little bit afterwards. Uh, usually it's dada. I don't know how that happens. Um, I think my oldest son's first word was baby. I think he said baby first, and I think it was because he was used to hearing it. And I know that my middle child had a first word because she talks now, but I did, wasn't sleeping a whole lot back then, so sorry, babe, I don't remember. Um, but usually consonant vowel pairs, something like this, they're still kind of babbling, but they're starting to learn words are associated with actual things. 
So by two years, children have a vocabulary of around a few hundred words. By age six, about 10,000 words or more. And of course, these are averages. Some kids know more words than others, and we're going to talk about why that will be in just a second. So even when a child is not able to use words, they do still use symbols, something that means something else. It talks about, for example, infants will point, wave, smack their lips. So they do learn how to communicate before they can express a word. Um, they will learn that there are gestures that they can use to help get what they want. And this part of this is reinforcement. I pointed at something and you gave it to me. So next time I want it, I will point at it again because I was reinforced for pointing at it last time. And then as they get older, infants really start to understand, and toddlers during this time start to understand that these words are symbols for the objects, actions, properties, or whatever, that they are symbols that mean uh, the item itself. That's the name of that item, and they'll start to understand how to get what they want by using language. So fast mapping is a process that happens around 18 months, and you see a very quick gain in word learning. So sometimes it seems like kids go from almost not talking at all to all of a sudden using very large vocabularies. This typically happens around 18 months, although as I said, there will be some kids that have more language than others at this point for reasons we'll talk about in a second. So you have this rapid connection of new words to exactly what they're referring to. So kids will learn to be specific. That word, that is a ball, and I want the ball. And they'll use that exact word because they've been reinforced for that. And so now kids can use language in a very specific way to get exactly what they want, which is very reinforcing for kids. Assuming that parents are rewarding them for language, encouraging, encouraging them uh, to use language, then they will gain that language more quickly. So this is what I've been hinting at here. There's a huge individual difference in vocabulary. Lots of reasons for this. Some are nature, some are nurture. On the nature side of things, some kids have more of an innate ability for language. And we see that perhaps this has to do with memory. So kids might have good phonological memory. They're able to remember words and what they sound like um, sooner than other kids. But there's also an environmental aspect here. If kids are exposed to a rich language environment, so you're talking to the child, you're reading to the child, singing to the child, that kind of thing, they will be more likely to have a wider vocabulary, and this is going to continue on throughout their life. Now, one thing that we see here is that your vocabulary is a bit more similar and identical than fraternal twins. Well, identical twins happen when you have one egg, one sperm that splits in two, versus fraternal twins that happen when you have two eggs, two sperm. So identical twins have practically the same DNA, whereas fraternal twins are no more genetically alike than any other sibling pair. So if identical twins are more similar in their vocabulary than fraternal twins, that might suggest that there is a nurture or sorry, excuse me, nature, my bad, a nature biological component here because they share the same DNA and they have the same uh, vocabulary ability. Nature. Good. What about speaking more than one language, right? So in our culture, unfortunately, uh, this is not the norm to be able to speak more, lang more than one language. I remember being pregnant with my first child and telling my husband, well, he's going to learn a language. If he's going to learn a second language, he needs to learn it early on. Quick, I need to learn another language so I can teach it to my child. Um, and I was not super successful with that. Uh, I do have a very small understanding of French, very, very little understanding of French. But uh, oftentimes children do speak more than one language, and this can be really helpful for kids to, to speak more than one language. And they can acquire a language more easily at a young age than they can at any other point during their life. You may know this if you didn't know another language and then went to college and tried to learn one for a class. It is very difficult. So kids that are bilingual have smaller vocabularies for each language, but they'll have greater total vocabulary. So, for example, if a child speaks Spanish and English, um, they may not know quite as many words in English as other kids their age do. But if you combine the words they know in English and the words they know in Spanish, they're going to have usually a much greater vocabulary. Um, they're going to understand that words are arbitrary because... Um, and this is where I don't have examples because I don't speak multiple languages, but uh, the word for milk, 
I should know. Um, but the word for milk is different in Spanish and French and English. And so it's just an arbitrary name that we made up. It's the same substance, different, different names. Uh, so they can understand that better. Um, being able to multitask, um, even some self-control uh, might be a little bit better in kids that speak more than one language. So that's uh, something that's great if you're able to do that. How do we help kids learn language? Uh, talking to kids. Uh, sometimes this is hard to do when kids don't talk back to you. Uh, it can be, without thinking about it, really easy to go all day long without talking to baby very much. But talking to kids, uh, naming objects, so that's a spoon, that's a diaper, that's whatever, naming the objects. Um, using grammatically sophisticated speech. Wow, you know, it is normal for us to use some unsophisticated speech when we're cooing at our babies. However, one thing to do here is to read books because books use more advanced language. Even kids' books use more advanced language than most adults do in their everyday conversations. So reading books would be a great way to do this, describing pictures, asking questions as the child gets older and can answer questions like, you know, what color is this toy in this picture, that kind of thing. And then uh, as far as television is concerned, a lot of people uh, are against television viewing. The research says... It's kind of mixed here. TV doesn't usually cause a problem. First of all, the, the problem is sometimes what you're doing, which you would have been doing if you weren't watching television. So if we're watching television, but we're not reading books, we're not reading books because we're watching television, then television is a problem, not because television is a problem, but because it's replacing something that they need, which would be reading books. So making sure that we're not neglecting other things that they need and choosing high quality, age appropriate programming. So a PBS, that kind of thing. Um, that has vocabulary, storytelling, um, certainly some kids' shows have a lot more um, quality to them than others, and I'll just leave that there. So, reading is crucial for success in academics. Um, reading is one of those things where if you can't read, then you also probably can't do well in history, you can't do well in science. I mean, even math, you have to be able to read explanations, read instructions, read word problems. So reading is huge. So your activity asks you to think about how to encourage kids to love reading and how to encourage parents to read to their kids. Because one of the ways to encourage kids to love books is to expose them to good books. But parents might not have the time or the energy or the, or the desire to read to their kids. So I want you to be thinking about how we can reinforce and reward kids for reading and reward parents for reading to kids. So I look forward to reading uh, your response here. Certainly, um, reading to kids is something that I think is crucial, um, something that uh, I am definitely passionate about. So last couple things here, how do kids acquire language and specifically perhaps the, um, the grammar rules of a language? A behaviorist would focus on reinforcement and punishment and imitation. So kids make a sound and parents make that sound back to them. And there's this imitation modeling process where kids try to say things that they hear other people say. Uh, and then they either get reinforced or punished for that. You might ask the question, why would you punish a child for using language? Well, as soon as they hear a curse word, they will look for all opportunities to humiliate the parents by using the curse word. So be sure not to, even if it's funny, it is funny sometimes when kids curse. Don't reinforce that. Uh, so behaviorists would say it's about reinforcement, punishment. Uh, the linguistic solution here is the idea that you are born with the ability to acquire language. Assuming that you don't have any health conditions that prevent that, you were born with language centers in your brain. Uh, your brain is hardwired to learn language, so it's natural for you to learn language. Assuming that you get even a very basic exposure to language, you will learn. Uh, a cognitive viewpoint here would say that we use logic to help us understand the rules. So we have schemas, right? We have these categories uh, for different kinds of words. And so we have these rules about language that we learn because it's natural for us to categorize things, to be able to detect patterns and, and understand logic. It's just natural for us. And then, of course, we could have an eclectic viewpoint here where it's a combination of all of these things, which is probably the most common way of looking at it. You do have to be born with uh, a biological capability to learn language, but then you also have to be able to think logically and to be reinforced and to model uh, to be able to acquire language. So likely the answer is all of the above. So last thing here, we just have a little bit of information. We've already covered most of this, but 
Um, at the beginning, babies are not able to produce sounds. Really, they just cry, and that's about it. Um, but they begin to coo, kind of make those vowel sounds around two months, and then babbling at about six months, bringing in some consonant sounds. Um, as kids get older, they learn gestures, uh, as well as beginning to use words, probably just single words at first. But then perhaps um, they can put together sentences, short sentences, um, by around two years, maybe 18 months, something like that. Also around 18 months, fast mapping occurs where kids pick up uh, vocabulary at an almost alarming rate. And then as they get older, uh, they learn a little bit more about how to use language appropriately. They continue to model what they hear. Vocabulary expands. Uh, and they're also, um, during this time period, they're learning how to um, maybe perhaps talk differently to different people in different situations, how to use language appropriately. All right, so lots of information today. Let me know if you have any questions about any of this. Now, remember that you do have all the information that you need now for exam one. So refer back to my announcements at the beginning of lecture about exam one. Also be looking out for the review video where I will talk about the study guide. So let me know if you need anything, and then I will talk to you guys after exam one.